Greenville, Mississippi, if you know where that is, uh, on the Delta for a while. Um, but we're going to go through the presentation. Um, and the, really the point of the presentation uh, is to look at the impact of the differences in public opinion throughout the country by region uh, and the legal landscape and to have with that understanding as well some demographic differences and with that understanding then look at the lives, the kind of socioeconomic reality of LGBT people in different parts of the country and you can, I, I think the, the driving point is you can really see a relationship between where things have advanced in terms of social support and legal support um, and um, where things haven't advanced so much uh, on the ground for people. So it's not only a matter of there's not a state level non-discrimination law, the lack of that law and the lack of that public support, actually you can see in this demographic portrait impacts uh, people's day-to-day -day experiences um, in some dramatic ways I think that surprised us when we first put together this material. So Andrew and Christy are gonna talk a lot about um, kind of public opinion in the South and um, the legal landscape. Um, and you all kind of know this, so I'm gonna go over the first part of this quickly and then they'll give you a deeper dive into each of those areas. But basically, as we know, um, oh, the other thing I forgot to say, during this presentation, if you wanna look at this on your phone, your computer, whatever, I encourage you to, you can play with it as much as you want. It's very interactive. You can look it up at the Williams Institute LGBT Divide. So feel free either during this presentation or afterward uh, to play along. Um, you can also stop me at any moment uh, and ask any questions. Um, but basically we know that public opinion has been increasing on LGBT issues. Uh, and if you go back um, in this uh, presentation that Andrew put together quite dramatically from the 1970s to the present, uh, this is a basic question about how Americans feel um, about the morality of uh, sexual relations uh, between two adults of the same sex. And really a lot of great work by the LGBT movement has uh, really changed these numbers over the last decade. So the bottom line um, is those um, expressing that it's not wrong, uh, the, the top line that it is wrong, and they're converging with more and more support. Uh, the way you know this is really the result of a movement, um, what do you think these lines look like if the questions were about uh, do you think sex uh, either outside of marriage or before marriage is wrong or not wrong? Would the lines look similar? Actually, no, they pretty much flatlined over the last 30 years. So in this type of questioning, people are just about as likely as they were 30 years ago to, to say that they think sex, <laughs> that sex before marriage or outside of marriage is wrong, even though there's been a lot of changes uh, uh, or a lot of recognition of those behaviors before and after marriage. So this is, I think, uh, a great evidence of the uh, important work of coming out in the LGBT rights movement. Uh, at the same time, we have an increasing number of states uh, that have passed uh, discrimination laws. And um, there's tons of work obviously going on at the local level. And this entire analysis doesn't take that into account. So for um, the data analysis we're gonna get to in a couple of slides, we're focused here on states uh, that have a law that at least includes sexual orientation discrimination. This maps out um, in the dark pink, states that include sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, in the light uh, pink, uh, those that have sexual orientation but not gender identity. I mean, some change in New York, there wasn't a statutory change, but a um, governor's interpretation that now applies sex discrimination to gender identity. So a little change in here. I, I think what's interesting in this, and if you kind of play around with this timeline, um, is that the changes, um, if I go back to the 1970s and move forward, uh, you'll see a period in the 80s and 90s where more laws were passed. Um, and then it kind of flatlines out. Does anyone know the last state at the state level that passed a, a non-discrimination law that includes LGBT people? Kind of the last five years you see no change until Utah pops in there about a year and a half ago with a deal struck by the Mormon church. Both sexual orientation and gender identity are included, but with a religious exemption that the, that the church um, signed off on uh, before the law was passed. So obviously a lot of effort is going on at the local level, which the map doesn't reflect, and then a lot of attention right now is focused on getting these state level protections in place. Um, but as we know, the increase in legal protections uh, and the increase in public support have a geography. So there was much done here, but breaking up the states into the regions that I'm gonna use for the rest of the analysis. Um, uh, but obviously no state level law for discrimination that includes sexual orientation or gender identity in the South. 
Uh, what's also left out is uh, the Midwest and a pretty good part of the upper Middle West, and then what we call the mountain states, uh, the states kind of between the West Thank Coast. You. Uh, in the Midwest, in the uh, northern part of the country. So uh, these are the divisions I'm going to be using. They're based on census divisions of the country. So already we uh, posted something online earlier about increased public opinion uh, support for LGBT use in the South. And people are like, I don't think Maryland and Delaware is in the South. Um, uh, <laughs> some people there do, actually. <laughs> actually. Uh, uh, my brother lives in Maryland, so I don't know if, if they would agree with that characterization. But uh, these are based on Census Bureau definitions. That's why we broke up. Uh, we had to use some sort of categorization. And that's what we used. The only thing uh, that we uh, did is broke up the mountain states from the West Coast uh, be, in, in, in part because of the lack of protections in all of the mountain states. So there's a geography to the protections. If I showed you sodomy laws in uh, 2002, you would see the same geography. If I showed you marriage laws in 2012, you would see the same geography. This is a familiar geography uh, in terms of legal protections. Um, there's also differences uh, in public support. Um, and this is an index. Andrew, do you want to explain the index that you created here? Sure, I can talk about it now. I'm going to talk about it later, too. But, um, so quickly. Uh, we combined uh, several different questions about people's attitudes and beliefs about LGB people. Sadly, a lot of the survey research that is out there that's done by Gallup and many of these organizations have yet to really incorporate transgender people into those questions just yet. It's getting better now, though. There's data, there's data being collected that I'm very well aware of. Um, but what we were able to do is take those uh, uh, polls and actually combine them, like make a big, huge, larger poll and actually analyze kind of what people's attitudes are by state. And what I did is that I combined people's positions on marriage equality, non-discrimination, uh, general beliefs, whether or not being uh, gay is a sin, um, and a few other types of questions in that same, in similar vein, and created an index from those, from those estimates. And so this index ranges from the low 40s to the high, to the high 90s, uh, with an average at about 60, so we think of it as kind of like a, a social and political climate kind of index, where we these numbers here are just the summary of like what are the average levels by each region. Yeah, and so what you can see, because you can still see the, the states with the, the legal protections outlined in that darker bowl, is for example in the south, no legal protection and unfortunately the most challenging social climate. Uh, in the country, um, followed by the mountain states in the Midwest, more legal protection and more social support. So the social support probably leads to legal protection, and the legal protection uh, reinforces the social submit support. So big legal as well as kind of social climate differences uh, in the regions of the country. Um, and there's also obviously big demographic differences uh, in the different regions of the country, and um, you know we're kind of seeing that dramatically played out right now as we see the votes come in uh, in different primaries and how much uh, race and ethnicity are kind of uh, impacting the outcome of primaries in this presidential election. Um, uh, in in terms of population overall, um, about uh, over 63 percent. Uh, of LGBT people live, uh, in, you know, what we call on the coast the flyover states. So, like, uh, uh, they live in the mountain states, the Midwest, uh, and the South, and obviously about a third of LGBT people in the country uh, live in the South. Uh, when I refer to LGBT people uh, in the rest of the presentation, the data that I'm taking is actually from the Gallup Daily Tracking Poll. So this uh, tr this poll uh, asks a lot of different questions about public opinion, uh, uh, you know, demographic, socioeconomic status. They added a sexual orientation and gender identity question, one question several years ago that asked, "Are you LGBT? Yes or no?" Uh, and so these are the results of uh, people marking yes in that question that allows us to divide up LGBT individuals and to understand a little bit more about them. Um, so a lot of folks live in these regions, um, and then there's a lot more racial and ethnic diversity in these regions. Um, and so to orient you to the kind of color coding on this slide and through the rest of the presentation, the LGBT people will always be represented by orange, uh, and the straights are left with a gray. So the grays, um, <laughs> which are one of the main types of aliens, um, are also straight people um, in this presentation. So what you'll see here is that the gray line, um, the darkest gray line is always longer 
uh, goes more around more of the um, perimeter of the circle than the big orange slice. This is white LGBT Americans in the South, non-white, um, which means uh, there's more racial and ethnic diversity in every single region. Uh, but there are also big differences, and so you'll see that right there. So you can see LGBT people compared to non-LGBT people in each region. This is on uh, the percent white. Uh, that percentage is higher for non-LGBT people if you look at every region. Uh, but among the non-white populations uh, in the regions, uh, there are big differences. So if I... Are you saying that more... More LGBT people are not, people of color. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Are people of color in every region? And so let me flip to the other side. So I live in the Pacific region. Uh, there's a larger percentage of Latinos in the Pacific region, uh, as well as kind of in the mountain states. And you'll see it's less, uh, and that's true. Um, so 30%. Of folks on the West Coast, and the West Coast is mainly California. Uh, in this breakdown, are LGBT in the South? It's 16 percent. But in both cases, there are more Latino LGBT people than non-LGBT people. The other big racial and ethnic group driving uh, these percentages are the uh, percent African American. Again, if you look in every region, there are more Black people identifying as LGBT. People, LGBT uh, the non-LGBT, uh, but big geographic differences, particularly in the South, um, with about 22% of LGBT people in the South identifying as African American. So when we first looked at these uh, Gallup Daily Tracking Poll, which is really the first glimpse we got of a national representative sample of LGBT people, one thing that really surprised us and people as well is that people of color were more likely to identify as LGBT as white people. And I think there were assumptions and stereotypes to the opposite, but at least on this national survey, uh, and I actually think it was African American LGBT people had the, or African American people had the highest rate of identifying as LGBT. Um, we can map this. We love to map things, and I'm actually going to start with a map of white LGBT people in the United States. If I showed you a map of where people lived in the United States, it would look a lot like this. But this um, shows density. I'm switching the data source. This is now census data from the 2010 census. So I'm dealing with same-sex couples, uh, not individuals. But we think it's a pretty good indicator uh, for the entire LGBT population. But we switched data sources. The darker the orange, um, the more LGBT people uh, live uh, in that area, the kind of the greater density given the population uh, as a whole. Um, and so you can see, you know, you probably can recognize some people, you can see that close to North Carolina, or if you look on your phone or a computer, you can get down to the county level uh, with this data. Um, and as a matter of fact, I hate to risk somewhere in there is the county we're in. It's a little too small. You saw it. You know it's possible. <laughs> don't want to, I don't want to depress my luck. So that looks like a map, basically, of America. But then um, this is a map where black LGBT people live in the United States. It looks like a map where black people live in the United States in terms of density, that more people in these counties uh, are black. These are the densest areas. So you see the South. So what this means is, you know, it didn't, it, there was really no thought about this, but if you think about where are the legal protections, where is the movement advanced the farthest, it's advanced in areas where a lot more white LGBT people live uh, than black LGBT people. Um, if you look at Latinos, the map changes uh, again, and this looks like a map where LGBT, where Latinos live in general, and you can see Texas, no surprise, Florida, uh, on the border of Mexico these days, and on, on the coast. So again, if you look at it this way, the legal protections, the social climate have benefited LGBT Latinos on the west coast, um, but the big area here, of course, uh, where that's not the case. Asian Pacific Islanders are heavily concentrated on the West Coast uh, and in kind of urban areas in New England, as well as in Florida, so you can see they actually do 
tend to live in states that have protections. Um, so big differences in demographics, uh, social climate, and legal protections. Um, I guess the last thing I want to show is another uh, demographic point um, that really differs by region, and that's the um, child rearing and the percent of same-sex couples in this case raising children. Um, you'll see lower rates of child rearing for same-sex couples on the coast, and these are two where protections have uh, advanced more in terms of parental rights, custodial rights, um, but higher rates of parenting in areas of the country where there are less protection, where there's more challenges and continue to be more challenges for LGBT parents. Um, does anyone know the state in the country that has the highest rate of same-sex couples raising kids? Mississippi. Wow. <laughs> Great, that comes from the Williams Institute. Uh, if you didn't know, that was analysis done by a demographer who's with the Williams Institute named Gary Gates. Um, does anyone know why that is? What, what are the same size couples in Mississippi are doing? Some of you are from Mississippi. Well, I just think a lot about the cultural relevancy of child rearing still being about couples in the South. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, I think what's true with, through all these slides, and um, we've actually done this, we could do it at the state level, we've actually done this for LA County itself, is that um, LGBT people of color tend to live in people of color communities as opposed to flocking to what we would think as kind of traditional or historic LGBT communities. Their characteristics tend to look like the people in the communities they live with. So more people in Mississippi actually have kids and therefore uh, like the people around them, more same-sex couples in Mississippi are raising kids. And we're gonna see that a lot um, with um, some of the socioeconomic data that we're going about we're going to get into, but I guess you know as you probably already know when you think about the South, more racial and ethnic diversity than other parts of the country, and particularly in terms of Black LGBT people and higher rates of child rearing. So the next thing we're going to look at is kind of map onto these maps. Um, some socioeconomic characteristics, and if you had asked me two years ago before we started thinking about this. Um, how would I sum up um, educational attainment for LGBT versus non-LGBT people? I would have said, um, you know, based on getting a college degree, LGBT people have a slight education advantage, that they are more likely to have a college degree than non-LGBT people. And I think that plays out in the national numbers. Does anyone know why that might be the case? We're just smarter. <laughs> <laughs> There's one theory. <laughs> we work harder. No College harder. campuses are more accepting. Okay, more accepting, yeah. Yeah, as a coping mechanism to protect oneself against discrimination. Yeah, yeah. And I think that bears out in that, um, and yeah, I think that bears out, is that um, it becomes a protective way, particularly if you can't in general rely on resources of a family, you know, you're going to kind of make it on your own, then there might be more reason to invest in education. Um, you know, half of LGBT people are women. If you are facing a gender wage gap and know that you're not gonna rely on a, a man's wage or a man's family wage, uh, particularly when you're thinking about these being people of all ages, uh, then maybe it makes sense to invest in education kind of knowing that you're gonna rely on your own income. And so when you're comparing big groups of people, LGBT versus non-LGBT, I think particularly among women that becomes a, a big characteristic. That dries up these percentages. Um, so there's gonna be two comparisons on the next set of maps, and I'm gonna kind of move quickly through them because they all start telling the same story. The first at the bottom compares LGBT people who live in protective states. And as I said earlier, we're defining protective states as those states which have a statewide non-discrimination law that includes sexual orientation. So it includes those states that just have sexual orientation and not gender identity, a few states left like that. The non-protective states don't have such a law, so every state in the South. So what you can see is there's a lot more educational advantage, there's a lot more people with a college degree for LGBT in the protective states than the non-protective states. And you see big regional differences. So almost 40% of LGBT people on each of the coasts having a college degree. Um, the Midwest is actually the lowest, it's about a third lower there in the Midwest. Um, and about 20% lower in terms of educational attainment in the South. 
Now, in general, there are big regional differences in this country in terms of uh, educational advancements and college degrees, so this could just reflect that people in the Midwest and the South are less likely to have a college degree uh, than people uh, on the coast, and it could still be that there's an educational advantage for LGBT people uh, in these regions. And I think that would have been my hypothesis before we did this analysis, and I think what we found uh, surprised us is that that isn't the case. So we're bringing the grays back into the analysis again. Remember, the grays are the straight people, and let's go to the, bo the uh, bar charts on the bottom first. And so what you can see is that trend that I pointed out in the beginning, that you know, the baseline assumption that um, LGBT people had an educational advantage is true in the states where there is a better social climate and a protective law. It flattens out. There's basically no difference if you consider all non-protective states together. So it's not true in the majority of states uh, that currently don't have a protective law. But uh, what really surprised us is what we looked when we looked at the region. Uh, so if the orange, if the LGBT part, if the circle is bigger than the gray dotted line, that means LGBT people have an educational advantage. If the circle is smaller than the line, that means they have a disadvantage. So that national advantage I was talking about really turns out only to be true in the Pacific. Uh, it kind of flat lines out both at 39% uh, on the East Coast. Um, there is not much difference actually in the South, so a lot. It is like a heat map, so think of it as like temperatures. Blue is cooler and red is hotter. I, if any of you are uh, very much into politics, I'm a political junkie, this map may seem completely flipped yeah. to you. <laughs> red and blue. Um, so, so just keep in mind that blue is cooler attitudes. And so what you find is, of course, uh, that the coastal states tend to have the warmer climates, and then that the Midwest and the South tend to have the cooler climates, and especially the South. Uh, if you look at these states right here, this cluster, I think that's your largest clustering of states that have the lowest uh, measures in terms of social and political attitudes. Now, since we are focused on the South, I decided to kind of crack open that little segment. <coughs> so here we have, now these numbers aren't our social and political climate index numbers because, uh, because the, the wealth of data that's out there, the most the most of it that's been done in terms of public polling has been on marriage equality. So this is the average level of support of marriage equality by county uh, in the South. And so you can see though that even within the South, these, these areas, that if you look at the statewide map, it's cool, it's like not so accepting. There are pockets of acceptance within the South, right? Not too many, <laughs> but, but, but you see this element in Florida and South Texas, um, and you start seeing uh, more neutral color, so as it gets closer to white, keep bear in mind that's getting close to like 50%, which means you're at the cusp of a majority. And uh, I know that we were trying to identify uh, Buncombe County, so I decided to do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so this is, uh, and this 49.9% estimate comes from around 2012 to 2014, kind of averaging across those years. So if attitudes have continued to change, this number might be actually a little low. So, um, but yeah, so that's where we're at. Um, and so basically, I just want to emphasize that even within certain contexts that we just might think of blatantly as unaccepting, that we can find accepting environments within them. And I'm sure all of you day to day have found your own accepting communities within your own, wherever you live. In your, uh, and so th there are going to be pockets of acceptance within any location. So let's talk about social attitudes and its relation to LGBT policy. Now this plot um, here, it's a little bit more complicated, so I'm gonna walk you through it. So on the x-axis here, I just provided an average score of people's acceptance of LGBT people, so very unaccepting to very accepting. And then each row here is a state. That font is very small, but these are the southern states, and these are everybody else. Right. Can we go back to the slide where the South wasn't the last? <laughs> <laughs> so, and so here when the, when the color gets more red, the higher the probability that that state has an inclusive, transgender inclusive non-discrimination law. So here we just see that there is a direct correlation 
between social acceptance on one hand and whether or not a state actually has a policy on the other. Now, this relationship, though, is not necessarily all that's always perfect. Christy and I wrote a paper that actually assessed at what level of support do you need for saying uh, that people to say, oh yes, I, don't, don't, I think discrimination against transgender people is bad. Well, most people think discrimination is bad in general, right? So when you ask people that question, support is usually around 70 to 80 percent, right? Well, what that also means is that when you look at that measure, it takes much more than a majority of support before a state actually is more likely to have that policy. And so we found, I think it was what, do you, do you recall the estimate? I think it was 75, 78 percent. Like if the state doesn't have a level of 78 percent of support or not, you wouldn't be able to see them, they would be highly unlikely to have a transgender inclusive non-discrimination ordinance. And we call this the democratic deficit, that it takes substantially more than a majority of support to sometimes to get states to actually pass these laws. Um, and so there is a definite direct correlation with transgender non inclusive non-discrimination ordinances that's definitely the, the case with every uh, other uh, LGBT rights issue. So social acceptance and public opinion does affect kind of broadly the policy process and it does it is consequential. So outside of policy, I also wanted to talk a little bit about how social acceptance may affect and influence uh, uh, public health and LGBT health. And so here is uh, a plot that is, again, the x-axis here is acceptance of LGBT people, and this is only of the South. This is analysis of only LGBT people and non-LGBT people residing in the southern states. Um, and what this is, is the acceptance measures by county. So that map that I showed you before is now what's plotted what's on the x-axis. On the y-axis here is the percent of LGBT and non-LGBT people reporting that their health was either fair or poor. Compared to, so the other, the, all, the other alternatives they could have said was that they have excellent, great, or good health. So either think about, they selected, eh, I'm not so good, right? That I'm fair or my health is poor. And what we see here, two things. At the low end of acceptance, we see that there's a higher rate of LGBT people reporting that they have fair and poor health than non-LGBT people. Right, and this is what Brad had referenced as disparities, right? It's a disparity between sexual minority, sexual and gender minorities and the general population, or uh, as I think Brad also said, the straights, right? Um, <laughs> as acceptance increases, the gap minimizes, right? The disparities begin to go away. And actually at the higher end, there is no disparity. And so, and then what I also found was fascinating when I did, did this little analysis was that not only did LGBT health improve, but so did non-LGBT health. Mm -hmm. And I've done this work um, with uh, Mark Hatzenbuehl and others and Gary Gates, um, where we've actually shown that there's a benefit not only to just LGBT people when it comes to social attitudes and acceptance of LGBT people. Mm -hmm. That in terms of smoking cessation, general rates of reporting on health, and certain elements of emotional and mental health and well-being, that social acceptance matters and it's not isolated to just LGBT people. There's kind of a... something that I don't see, and that is a breakdown uh, per biological gender. Sure. Because aren't there huge differences? That, uh, in, uh, among LGBT people or among the general population? Among LGBT there, there are definite differences within, um, within LGBT people in terms of gender differences. Um, uh, this analysis didn't really take into account gender differences, but uh, do I- Do any of the analysis that you do? So far, uh, not for this presentation, but there's definitely things that can be, like uh, the, the work that I had referenced with uh, Mark and Gary that expands upon this idea mm -hmm. does uh, control, or at least account for gender, race, and ethnic differences, individuals, uh, relationship status, and Isn't whether they have children. I mean, uh, one of the things in the earlier presentation was that uh, LBGT people are more educated and yet they're more <coughs> insecure. More. So how does that happen unless there's a difference between genders? Well, there, I mean, what accounts for all this? 
Well, I, I mean, so, uh, well, there's, there's definitely a lot of things that account for the relationships that we do see in these data. Um, uh, some of the things that we try and pull out from the story that we're telling today is more about the relationship that acceptance has on these outcomes. Uh, we can completely refashion another study that's based solely on what is the effect, or what are the differences in biological gender among LGBT people, and how that relates to food insecurity, health, health, and all those other topics. Yes, so, is it not relevant? Oh, it's definitely relevant. Uh, it's just, uh, it was just not part of the story that's being emphasized right now. Yeah, I think this, I mean, like, this presentation is really focused on kind of region and geography, but, you know, for example, all the work that we do on poverty, for example, is, I mean, gender is probably the most important factor in looking at who is poor and who is most likely to be poor um, in the LGBT community is gender and gender identity. And there's some fact sheets over here broken down by state and almost any time we do anything um, on education or income, we're looking at gender differences. So. I'm just yeah. So, um, and we do try in most of our reports account for gender differences among LGBT populations. But, but aren't you looking at an overall um, increase in the quality of health comprehensively for every for everyone, yes. so both LGBTQ as well as um, non-LGBTQ? Yes. There's an overall benefit for virtually everyone, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what this that's what this relationship is bearing out, and. Um, and it, as we, as I did indicate, we do try to account for individual demographic differences among LGBT and non-LGBT people. And then one thing that we also did is that we accounted for other things that might explain why counties differ from one another. So we looked at uh, college educational, college level of educational attainment. We also looked at median income within the county, as well as uh, presidential vote share, just to make sure that we're not looking at general levels of kind of partisanship or ideology. And so, and the relationship remained robust with those th with those elements included. So, um, so we do think, and uh, that there is a, re a relationship between social acceptance and kind of uh, these health uh, outcomes among LGBT people and non-LGBT people. Let's see. Uh, shifting gears again. So now, just to talk about just attitude change and time. Uh, as we know, as the whole country as a whole has had a, while, a pretty dramatic shift in its acceptance of LGB people. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the surveys aren't as trans-inclusive, and so we'll be careful about what words I use. Um, but, uh, but there have been politicians, notably some very uh, 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 southern politicians who have um, have made the argument that attitudes have not changed in the South. Um, uh, I can I, I've been asked uh, by uh, reporters from regional newspapers going, this politician said this. I said, well, that's not true because um, uh, attitudes have changed. Uh, so this is just uh, acceptance of uh, marriage equality over time. Uh, isolating just the southern states going from 92 to 2016. Um, and uh, so these are, these estimates are of course smoothed over time so that way it's more readable. I didn't want to give you a whole bunch of jaggedy lines. But, um, but overall what I have uh, observed nationally is that uh, acceptance has uh, increased at, a, at an accelerated rate. And that is consistent if you were to look at estimates of support at each statewide level. So that's why these estimates are curving like this, because it, it, uh, attitude change has been occurring at an accelerated pace. It actually looks like it got worse before it got better. Is there any indication? Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, there's this dip, right? There's this, and that's a part of the, a part of the thing that's helping the acceleration was that this, this, this change right here Right, is practically no change. We see a dip, but if you were to say, is this estimate statistically significantly different from the one before it, the answer would be no, right? This is almost like stagnation. And then you get a pickup uh, coming, coming around 2008. Yes? Um, what do you think could account for um, the sort of downward slope of states like Alabama, Arkansas, and Oklahoma? Um, well, there's definitely at this time period, right, a lot of attention, a lot of statewide initiatives and amendments 
uh, going on in relation to LGBT rights and so marriage. Is, well, it, and it's also the negative attention at that time, right? There was a lot of negative attention. Uh, there was a, that social climate then was definitely negative, and that a lot of states were passing. Uh, uh, what was Hawaii, nineteen ninety eight? Was when that was when marriage kind of re emerged as a national topic and national question and issue. And since then, there was a bit this large discussion of a backlash that occurred post Hawaii, right? And um, and I think what's reflective in this in these trends as well as what's reflective in the national trends is largely a negative and stagnant change in the early 90s and late 90s. Uh, and, and actually, if you were to talk to anyone who studies these trends, um, and you were to ask them back in 2002, maybe 2004, if attitudes are changing, they'd most likely tell you no. Um, and they wouldn't expect those attitudes to change. Um, and as Brad had mentioned earlier about the acceptance of, extra, uh, of uh, uh, certain types of uh, sexual intercourse outside of marriage, um, you can look at almost any other indicator, uh, uh, approval of unrestricted abortion, um, uh, gun rights, and the only other issue that the public has changed as dramatically as uh, on LGBT rights and marriage equality specifically is marijuana legalization. <laughs> that is the only other issue that has seen such generated change. Um, and so, you know, so our null hypothesis, right, are, is that we shouldn't see any of this change. This shouldn't be occurring. And so that it is occurring, that it has occurred, is one, dramatic, and two, not isolated to the states that you would only think it should apply to, or it's just California or just New York. Yes? I was thinking, too, that some of the messaging was very experimental during that time. And looking back at some of the messaging that has been done, uh, it's changed a lot, like, well, you all are doing research and figuring out and other groups figuring out, you know, how do you message to the general population? Right, right, right. Yeah, and uh, there was a lot of visibility topic uh, as well. Um, uh, the rate at which people reported that they know someone who is uh, lesbian or gay uh, increased at the same time that you started seeing a lot of these attitudes in increasing. So there's a role of just LGBT people coming out and being visible that has that's playing along. There's messaging, uh, the messages early on in the marriage debates were focused largely on uh, rights and benefits of marriage. Uh, I think I recall reading an older document about how many rights do you, uh, how many federal rights, was it 1,100? Like, I had that number memorized for a period of time. You know, and, and so there, so, and this flip, where in this change in messaging about why marriage matters and love and commitment, and that that shift in frame may have also facilitated and contributed to this conversation. Um, it's hard, statistically, it's hard to, as, a, as, a, as a data head to think about how do I in, add a layer of this qualitative message changed, right? When the message changed, I think, a, a somewhat unevenly changed at different places at different times. And then, of course, political contexts, right? I mean, 2012, four states with something related to marriage on the ballot. And, uh, and so people talking a lot about that topic at that time, using this love and commitment frame as opposed to uh, rights and benefits type of approach. So yeah, so there's definitely a lot going on. Um, any other questions on the trends? OK. So I do want to take a brief segue um, and actually talk about some new work that's going to be coming out with two of my colleagues and good friends. Uh, this is David Brockman at Stanford, and this is Josh Kala at UC Berkeley. Um, they teamed up with a local organization in Florida, which is great because now we're right back in a southern state, uh, where they conducted a canvassing experiment in relation to understanding whether or not having a conversation with people about transgender inclusive non-discrimination actually can move people. So you canvass them, you go to their doorstep, and you have a conversation, right? And in that conversation, what these two scholars uh, believe is going on is that uh, at a point in time when they're having that conversation, they ask the person at the doorstep, has there ever been a time that you felt like you've been othered? Has there ever been a time where you've been felt like you were treated differently? 
And it was, they believe that it's because of the linkages, because what happens is that they go, oh yeah, and they elaborate on that experience, they elaborate on that story. And then they go, well, I guess that might be what it's like when, uh, when I talk about someone who's transgender. And I don't have to understand everything about what it means or what it is to be transgender, but that it, it feels wrong to feel othered, right? Well, they did this, they, they randomized, which means that they went to some doors, they knocked on doors, they had that conversation. They knocked on other doors and they talked about recycling. I think it's recycling. Um, <laughs> And then they measured people's attitudes. They measured uh, in a survey. Now, uh, I am not plotting their results because their results will be published for a month or so. So I plotted what I, will, what I know is representative of their results. <laughs> so, um, so all those caveats in mind. And so um, what they actually found is that if you looked at like general acceptance of LGBT rights or transgender inclusive non-discrimination, remember how I told you that people say discrimination is bad, right? And well, they found that there was no change when people had that conversation and when they didn't. And they said, well, we think this is, there should be change. And they said, we think that might just be because people say discrimination is bad, right? And so what they did three months into the survey is that they, in, they embedded another experiment. And what this experiment did is that it showed the opposition's messaging on uh, their frame on transgender and inclusive non-discrimination ordinances, the bathroom bill, if you were to think of Houston. They, put, they showed people that, that kind of message. And what, you found, and what they found is that when they showed people that, people declined in their level of support. But the ones that had the conversation had the least levels of that decline. And afterward, if you followed up after that conversation, they're the ones that actually reacted. They had like this lashing back, and then you saw an increase in their levels of support versus those that did not have that conversation. So I find the work to be very fascinating. I can't wait till they actually publish it and do some press. It's actually gonna be sometime next month, early next month. And so, and you should, uh, 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 you can reach out to me, but then I'll put you in touch with them to really, you know, get a handle on what their methodology and their approach is. But I did want to share with this group kind of what's coming out in terms of the scientific research that can practically have really useful applications. Um, and so having conversations at the doorstep. Um, I saw your hand. This is really interesting because one of the things that you learned when you're talking about voir dire, picking a jury, some of the new systems and how a jury, for example, something called the command superlative method, is having people in a veneer talk about the most horrific or the most troubling or the most superlative experience that they've experienced, and then you're choosing what you ask them based on what your theory of the case is. Mm -hmm. So if your theory of the case is police misconduct, where the police have rushed to a conclusion, you're going to ask that veneer member, what's the uh, most um, troubling time that you can remember that you've experienced when someone made a, um, a decision about you that was wrong based mm -hmm. on rushing to conclusions? Mm -hmm. There's similar things that you can do when you're choosing a capital jury. And it, and it occurs to me that really what we're doing is we're not only weeding out the crazies from our juries, but we're also allowing the conversation that all the veneer has to educate every other jury member mm -hmm. so that we, they, when they go back in there and decide on the, the culpability of our clients, that they're able to say, well, wait a minute. Yeah. So this really doesn't surprise me because that's what they're teaching us in terms of how to choose juries. Well, it's great that it's one not surprising. It's also great that it works outside of the jury context. <laughs>